on September 18, 1946, Mammoth Cave National Park was officially established, encompassing 52,830 acres of land It is home to the longest known cave system in the world, the Mammoth Flint Ridge Cave System, which includes more than 400 miles of surveyed terrain. While the history of mankind's interaction with Mammoth Cave dates back thousands of years, it wasn't until the early 20th century when the landmark truly made a name for itself in American history an era that has become known as the Kentucky Cave Wars. During this time, those living in the cave country of central Kentucky found it difficult to generate enough income to support a family solely by farming. poor soil, which brought little profit, influenced families to seek out alternative forms of business. And for many, profit could be found in the multitude of natural caves found throughout the area. Mammoth Cave had been used on and off as a profitable tourist attraction since the 1830s, so it made sense that other locals with their own caves should be able to make financial use of them as well. So by the 1920s, an abundance of privately owned caves began competing for the attention and money of visiting tourists. Competition was fierce, and the tactics deployed were full of deception. The National Park became the target of every other cave owner in the area some of which placed misleading signs along the road to Mammoth in an attempt to lead visitors away from their intended destination toward locally owned caves. Due to this fierce competition, the best option for these profiteering cave owners was to either find another opening into Mammoth or to discover a new, even more beautiful cave. Cave fever escalated quickly, but it would not end happily, as the most prolific cave explorer of Kentucky found himself trapped in one of these new discoveries. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. On July 20th, 1887, William Floyd Collins, the man who would one day become the, quote, greatest cave explorer in the world, was born into a family in Auburn, Kentucky. Floyd's passion for caves developed as early as the age of six, when he was found wandering alone in nearby Salt Cave. Throughout the rest of his childhood, and even early adulthood, caving was merely a recreational pursuit for the young man. But by the age of 23, Floyd turned to his passion for profit, purchasing 30 acres adjoined to his father's property. He scoured this land to find a cave of his own, which soon enough, he did. Unfortunately, this cave, aptly named Floyd's Cave, was small and unattractive. So in 1912, he went to work as a cave guide for Edmund Turner, who three years later discovered Great Onyx Cave. And the discovery of this beautiful attraction pushed Collins even farther into cave fever. Then, in 1917, the Collins family officially entered into the Kentucky Cave Wars after Floyd discovered Crystal Cave. 
Crystal Cave was beautiful. Its great room was 65 feet high, and the wall encrusted with hundreds of white and cream-colored crystals, known as gypsum flowers, some measuring more than 18 inches long. So the Collins family opened it up to the public as a show cave, charging an admission fee to visitors and tourists. Unfortunately, the cave's location was fairly remote compared to others in the region and failed to attract a significant amount of visitors. So Floyd Collins continued his search to either locate a new entrance to Mammoth Cave, which would garner attention, or locate an altogether new cave that was closer to Mammoth and Crystal. His location was key, drawing visitors to the site and increasing profits. But Floyd's drive was not solely monetary. The man genuinely had a passion for these natural wonders and aspired to discover as many of their secrets as he possibly could, a passion that bordered on mania. Over the following years, Floyd became known as a daredevil by his contemporaries and fellow cavers and developed a reputation for not only remaining calm in crisis, but for being skilled and fearless. He worked alone, almost always, of which Robert K. Murray and Roger W. Brucker wrote in their book Trapped, the story of Floyd Collins, quote, while caving alone, something no sensible person would ever do, Floyd edged through compression squeezes, chimneyed up sheer walls, climbed down vertical drop-offs, pushed for hours out of endless crawlways, and worked for days at dangerous breakdowns. Then, in 1925, still on the hunt for a new cave, Collins made agreements with three area farmers who owned property closer to the main highway. It was decided that if a cave was found on the land, Collins would enter a business partnership with the landowner and they would share in the responsibilities and profits of operating the attraction. So Collins went to work and in January of 1925, he found a potential cave opening located beneath an overhang of sandstone. The entrance, however, was small, and it would take three weeks of work to expand the hole large enough to allow a man to slip through and explore. But Collins was convinced a great cave lay beyond this treacherous path which he began carving out of the limestone. And by employing crowbars, shovels, and dynamite, he made it possible to squeeze further and further into the cave. Some of the chutes and passages were so narrow, one only 10 inches high, that to pass, Floyd had to lay flat on the ground and squirm his way through. Then, on January 30th, Collins maneuvered himself through narrow squeezes, twists, and turns to reach the bottom of a chute so tight that to enlarge the opening, he had to work upside down. Once successful, he traveled through and landed on a narrow ledge overlooking a hole 60 feet deep, which he then descended into. Unfortunately, Collins saw nothing of interest but it gave him hope because caverns of this nature typically gave the promise of more passages to explore. But by this time, his lamp began to flicker, a sign that it was time to leave. To make his way back up the tight chute, he had to squirm forward on his belly. Eager to get through the space, Collins pushed his lantern ahead of him a regretful mistake as it fell over, leaving the explorer in absolute darkness. True to his reputation, Collins did not panic. It was not the first time 
He had been left without a light source, and he knew his way out of this cave. Still on his belly, he pushed out with his right foot for a final surge out of the chute, but he miscalculated his location and struck his foot on one of the many protruding rocks that made up the ceiling of the space. As a result, a rock broke loose and fell, landing on top of his left foot and ankle, effectively trapping his foot into a V-shaped indentation in the floor. Collins attempted another kick to dislodge himself, but only brought down more debris. The veteran cave explorer was trapped. Collins was lying on his side at about a 45 degree angle. His left arm was partially pinned under him and his right held close to his body by a wall. The limestone boulder of the ceiling above was only a few inches away from his chest, preventing him from turning over. Murray and Brucker wrote that, quote, Floyd was in a coffin-like straitjacket. Now the panic had set in. In the darkness, Collins was unable to assess the situation and began to shift and twist his body in any way possible in an effort to free himself. When he finally regained his senses, he realized every movement made the problem worse, bringing down more debris and tightening it around him. The only thing left for Floyd Collins to do was to yell and scream for help, which he did, until finally he went hoarse and could scream no longer. All the while, he began to shiver in the cold, damp cave, and on the boulder above him, a small stream of water flowed along and dripped down into his face. Floyd Collins entered Sand Cave on Friday, but it was not until Saturday morning that B. Doyle, the property owner Collins had been staying with, realized he hadn't come in the night before. Eventually worried, Doyle went down to the cave and called for Collins, but after receiving no answer, he assumed Floyd was not inside. It wasn't until the following morning that some concern had set in so several men entered the cave to find him. Unable to navigate through the tight squeezes, passageways, they settled for shouting Floyd's name, and to their surprise, he responded. As calmly as he could, Collins asked for tools to be brought to get him out, and that overall, he was mainly just cold and hungry. He also asked that his brothers Marshall and Homer come to the cave. Marshall arrived first with a group of five men, but of those men, only one was able to make it all the way to Floyd's location, while the rest, including Marshall, got stuck or left out of fear. Once the truth of Floyd's predicament was discovered, the news traveled quickly through cave country. Many locals were quick to make their way to the site in an effort to help free Collins from the earth. Homer Collins, who had caved with his brother before, was the first to successfully reach him. Homer attempted to dig around Floyd, but progress was slow. Only one person could dig at a time, and the space was so constricting that only small buckets of dirt and gravel could be filled. The work was exhausting, physically and emotionally. In an attempt to speed the process along, Homer hoped to use a hammer to try and chip away the boulder above his brother. But Floyd feared the boulder would crack and fall on him. The pair also discussed the use of a blowtorch to make the rock brittle, but worried they might cause an explosion. So digging 
was the only option. Meanwhile, a crowd was gathering on the surface. Some arrived who wanted to assist in the rescue, but more were coming out of curiosity and the mere spectacle of the event. Yet for all the men who came to the site and attempted to go into the cave, only a handful ever reached Floyd Collins. According to Murray and Brucker, quote, there was something truly fearful about Sand Cave that had brought out the worst in men, and cowardice had clearly outstripped bravery. Soon enough, local media began reporting on the incident. On Sunday, February 1st, the Louisville Courier Journal included a small article titled, Caven Pins Man Supine in Cavern, while the Herald Post hoped to scoop the courier by running an article with the title, Kentuckian Rescued from Cave, prompting the Courier Journal to send a reporter to the scene, a man named William Skeets Miller. Upon arriving at Sand Cave and asking about the situation, Homer Collins told Skeets to go into the cave and find out for himself. So he did, and surprisingly, the reporter was one of the few men both skilled and brave enough to reach Collins. As a result, Skeets himself would begin to assist in the rescue attempt. The outside world soon began to crowd in on the Kentucky cavers. Not only was there an ever-increasing number of curious onlookers showing up at the cave, but people from outside of cave country were also arriving to assist. Many who came had no special means of assistance, but some were miners, stone cutters, and the like. And one such man was Henry Carmichael, the superintendent of the Kentucky Rock Asphalt Company, which mines sandstone. When Carmichael arrived, it was clear there was no order to the rescue attempts whatsoever. No one was visibly in charge. Work was being done in the cave itself, but the outside was a mess. So he took control and began managing the situation. Meanwhile, progress was still being slowly made inside the cave. Johnny Gerald and Skeets Miller took turns digging around Floyd in an effort to make space in the hopes that they could use a crowbar to lever the rock off of Floyd's foot. As Skeets worked, he interviewed the trapped explorer, and at night, upon leaving the cave, Skeets filed his story. And on Tuesday, February 3rd, cities like Chicago, Washington, and New York began running papers with headlines like Cave Victim Near Release and Kentuckian Trapped Alive by Seven Ton Boulder. Most big city papers ran short and somewhat garbled articles due to the secondhand information they received. But it was this coverage that first gave the cave its name Sand Cave, a name that was completely inaccurate. Although there was sandstone over the cave entrance, the entire cave itself was actually cut from limestone. Then, on February 4th, catastrophe struck when a ceiling collapsed outside the chute where Floyd lay. The situation was reported to Carmichael that Collins was now trapped even worse than before, and it was unlikely they could rescue Floyd through the cave, as it would be too dangerous to dig through the breakdown. But Johnny Gerald was still convinced rescue was possible. 
a crack was discovered for a tube to be run through to Collins, allowing him to still receive food and water. Meanwhile, Gerald, along with Carmichael's men, worked to carefully dig out enough of the breakdown that a man could slip through. Gerald planned to take a grease gun to Floyd's foot so it could slip free. Yet before the plan could be enacted, a second cave-in occurred even closer to the entrance than the first. Floyd Collins was now truly trapped, cut off from the rescuers by two cave-ins. Soon enough, the state of Kentucky arrived to take control of the situation. Soldiers were brought in to secure the site and anyone who did not need to be there was sent away. Since the second breakdown, it had been decided that their problem was no longer caving expertise, but rather engineering. So at Carmichael's suggestion, they began digging a shaft on February 5th, using only shovels and pickaxes, so as not to trigger more cave-ins. At the outset, they were confident and making good time but eventually, the men hit limestone and everything slowed to a crawl. This slow progress left newspapers to invent stories on their own to keep up public interest. One told of Floyd's loyal dog sitting at the cave entrance, and another of a woman waiting for Floyd to be rescued so they could marry. By this time, the story had become viral, and notably was the first non-political event that the radio played a major role in disseminating to the public. Of course, the downside to the media attention was the curious onlookers. On February 8th, known as Carnival Sunday, it is estimated that between 10,000 and 50,000 people came to Cave City, Kentucky. Cars were parked for miles as a carnival atmosphere descended on the land near Sand Cave. People brought picnic lunches and locals sold concessions and souvenirs. Yet many who came that day left convinced that the whole thing was a hoax because there was nothing of note to be seen happening around the cave. These accusations resulted in a full-scale legal investigation as to whether or not Floyd Collins was actually trapped at all. One suggestion was that he was capable of coming and going from the cave at night and that this was merely a publicity stunt to bring tourists to Crystal Cave. Unfortunately, it was not a hoax. On Monday, February 16th, the men reached Collins. But they were too late. Floyd Collins had died. Unable to free him, Doctors examined him in place and determined his death was a combination of exposure, exhaustion, and starvation. They concluded that he had been dead for at least 24 hours. Later, a more detailed coroner's inquest determined that starvation was likely the primary factor, and although they could not be exact as to the date of his death, it was estimated that Floyd Collins probably died sometime on February 13, 1925, less than three days before the men could reach him. Although the plan was originally to bring Floyd to the surface, whether alive or dead, it was now determined that it was too dangerous to remove his remains. The rescue tunnel had come out in front of Floyd, not behind him, as had been intended, 
and for an unknown reason, Floyd was discovered tightly packed with gravel and dirt. All the prior work done to free him had been undone. The earth would not give up Floyd Collins, and so both the tunnel and Carmichael's rescue shaft were sealed. Floyd Collins remained in Sand Cave, and a makeshift funeral was held outside the entrance. Homer Collins, like the rest of his family, was firmly against leaving Floyd trapped in Sand Cave. Shortly after the rescue site was closed, he began raising funds to bring his brother's body to the surface, entering into a contract with a local miner to extract Floyd's remains. After weeks, they were successful, and the rock that trapped the once great cave explorer could now finally be removed. It was said to have been shaped like a leg of a lamb, and although initial estimates put its weight at over 50 pounds, it actually only weighed about 27. Floyd Collins' body was finally raised to the surface on April 23rd, 1925. Three days later, he received a second, proper burial and an estimated 400 people attended. He was then laid to rest in a grave near the path of his beloved Crystal Cave. Yet this grave would not be Floyd's last. In 1927, Floyd's father Lee, having become senile, sold Crystal Cave to Dr. Harry B. Thomas. And along with the cave, Lee gave Thomas permission to disinter his son and relocate his body into Crystal Cave itself. Electric lights were added to the cave, and Floyd was placed in the center, resting in a glass-covered bronze coffin. And for the first time, Crystal Cave was very profitable. But the rest of the Collins family were livid and attempted to get possession of Floyd's body. Unfortunately, they were unsuccessful. Then, on the night of March 18, 1929, Floyd's remains disappeared from Crystal Cave. A full search involving the police occurred, and the next day, he was found, hidden in a sack on the edge of the Green River, no more than 800 yards from the cave. Gruesomely, his leg was missing and never recovered. And regrettably, the perpetrator was never caught, although some still speculate today that Thomas orchestrated the entire event for publicity. Collins remained there in Crystal Cave until March 24th, 1989 when finally, after many years of requests from his family, he was moved to the Collins family plot of Mammoth Cave Baptist Church Cemetery. His epitaph reads, the greatest cave explorer ever known. Sand Cave remained sealed until 1977, when Robert K. Murray and Roger W. Brucker obtained permission to explore it for greater context and understanding of the events surrounding Floyd's death. So on June 4, 1977, after significant preparation, a group of cavers entered Sand Cave for the first time in decades. Mapping their progress as they went, the group compared their efforts to the map created during the 1925 rescue attempt. It was a tight and difficult expedition as they were forced to squeeze and squirm through the narrow passages. And every so often they came across artifacts from the 1925 rescue attempt, 
a green glass Coca-Cola bottle, a pipe tobacco tin, a whiskey bottle, and even a rusted l and Railroad lantern with a still intact glass globe and wick. But the most impactful discovery they made was a small nine-inch crack that had rescue workers found in 1925 would have given them access to warm, feed, and hydrate Floyd while rescue efforts continued, making the numerous days spent digging a shaft completely unnecessary. Sand Cave is not the most dangerous or beautiful cave in Kentucky. But when the 1977 expedition was inside, they noted feeling a breeze, which in a cave means one thing. It is a big cave with more rooms, passages, and possible entrances. This is likely why Floyd Collins kept working and why the greatest cave explorer ever known was willing to risk his life to uncover its still unknown secrets. My name is Brandon Schexniner, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independently released podcast written and produced by Brandon and Brianne Schexniner. For special access to members-only content, including access to the series Southern Gothic, The Monsters, as well as updates and links to our social media. Visit southerngothicmedia.com today. Lucky Lady Shack.